This is a feast that we celebrate every year at this time after Easter. It's the end of the Easter season. Easter is actually over this weekend. So praise God for the great time of Easter, celebrating Jesus' resurrection. And now at Pentecost, we celebrate that when God poured out the Holy Spirit on Jesus' followers, the resurrection life of Jesus now fills Jesus' followers, the church. And we are a new people. We are incorporated into Jesus' body. Now Jesus continues his life in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, who we've just said, he uh, comes to us from the Father through Jesus the Son. So tonight we're going to, to focus on this text from Ezekiel chapter 37, which is a beautiful and strange story. And we do bring everything that we've shared tonight to the text and to this time of, of listening for the voice of God in the sermon as well. We've carried our laments to God. We've carried our longings to God. We've carried our hard questions to God. And I believe that God does have something to say to us through this text. So let's pray, then we'll read, and then we'll talk through it. The Father in heaven, thank you that you hear us. Thank you that our hard questions are not hidden from you and that you do not shy away from them. Thank you, God, for your presence in mysterious and beautiful and hidden and hard places. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would open up our ears and our hearts to, to hear your voice ever more clearly, to love you ever more fully, and to obey you and, and walk in your ways with more integrity and more depth day by day. We pray, Lord God, that, that, that you would help us hear what you're saying to us through this ancient, ancient prophecy from the, from the prophet Ezekiel. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's read Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Come breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life, and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, 
declares the Lord. What a powerful word from God. Ezekiel. I don't know if you know much about this guy. Ezekiel was a priest who was living with the people of Israel far outside the land of Israel. Ezekiel was a priest whose ancestors had served in the temple, the temple in Jerusalem, the temple where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is. He had served in that, his ancestors had served there, in that place. And here he was, thousands of miles away, in what we would now call Iraq, in Babylon. Because his people, the people of Israel, had been conquered by the Babylonians or the Chaldeans, and they had been forcibly moved. They had been taken out of the land of Israel and forced to migrate to Babylon, where they were now living in exile. A really common strategy in that time when conquering nations knew that if you wanted to be able to keep a nation under control, you had to make sure that its leadership was either dead or not in the territory. And so they took the leaders of Israel out of the land of Israel and moved them to Babylon. And Ezekiel was a priest, a religious leader, a spiritual leader. And so he was with his people in Babylon. And as you can imagine, and as we, we know firsthand, this was an incredibly terrible time. The people of Israel now in a foreign land with a, with a language not their own. And they are not able to get back to the land that God had given them. And so really big challenges faced them. Questions like, what language will our children speak? Questions like, what about, how, like, how are we supposed to worship God when God has given us the temple and his presence is in the temple, but the temple is thousands of miles away and we can't get there? How are we to worship God and follow his commandments in this foreign land where they worship other gods that are not like the, the true God, the living God who, who called us to be his own people? How are we supposed to live? What happens when our children can't read Hebrew anymore? How will they know the scriptures? What happens when they don't think in the categories and the ways of speech of our ancestors? What happens when they feel like they connect more with the stories of Babylon than with the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What are we to do? And any community that goes through that and Thousands of communities across the world throughout history have gone through the same challenge and are still going through it today, here in Northeast London and in Canada, all over the place. There are always competing options. And some people said, listen, we just need to adapt. We've got to become like the Babylonians. If we can succeed in their system, that'll be fine. And we can, we can privately practice our Jewish faith. Sure we can. But we can also go to temple with the Babylonians because we have to for business, right? We've got to survive. And other people would say, listen, we, we, we can't live among the Babylonians. We should probably just live in Jewish communities, just all on our own, where we just speak our language and where we, where we can read our sacred texts. We can gather for worship. We can, we, can, we can just survive, maybe, maybe this way. All of these competing options would face the community. And in the middle of that, a priest who cannot worship in the temple, who cannot serve the way that his ancestors did, a guy named Ezekiel, somehow was taught to pray. And he was trained to be a prophet. And he was a man who could listen to the voice of God and speak the word of God to his community. A community under, under great pain, going through great suffering, faced with really hard decisions. And so this situation coming in chapter 37, to us on our first reading, this is the first time you've read this, might seem strange. I've had, I've had three or four conversations with people this week for whom this was the first time they've, they've heard the story. Like they've never heard the story before this week. And if, if this is the first time you're reading this story, then you might feel a little bit like my good friend who I was walking with the other night, who as I was telling him the story, he said, that would make an awesome movie. <laughs> he was like, and I, and I heard him say that. I was like, oh, yeah, it actually would, right? I mean, you can, you can imagine uh, the opening shot 
of a really high wide angle shot looking down an aerial shot maybe from a drone and you've got this mountain dry mountains on either side of a valley and there's just one solitary figure in the middle very small surrounded by what look like rocks and the 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 the, the floor of the valley is littered with rocks. But then the next shot comes down uh, to ground level and is looking up at that solitary figure. And what it is is a close-up in the foreground on a skull and some other bones. And in the background is this man by himself outlined against a harsh blue sky. And then the man begins to walk. He begins to move. And Maybe the drone's going back and forth, and you get to see how vast this whole valley is covered with bones. And this man is walking and making his way, trying to step over them, but sometimes kicking them, and it's clicking and clacking, and they're rolling away. And the loneliness, the isolation, the pain would be so evident. It would be a powerful movie, no question. And this is, very clearly, a vision. It says in the opening verse that the hand of the Lord was on me. This is Ezekiel writing. And God brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. And then God gives him this experience in the valley. And then later on, God says, this is what the experience means. God brings him to this valley full of dry bones, has him do incredible things in that valley. And then God says, these bones are the people of Israel, my people. And I want to take a minute and just consider how is it that the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord would give a person a vision like this? Because a vision is actually much more intimate than a movie, right? When we, when we see a movie, it's somebody else's picture being projected back at us. We, we, we see it on the screen and, and we, we interact with it however we interact with it. But when we have a vision, it's like a dream. And you know how dreams, when they're vivid, you feel it. You feel it emotionally. You feel it like almost tangibly, like your whole sensory um, capacity is engaged. And so when he is having this vision and he says he went to this valley that was full of bones and it says that God led him back and forth among them, among the bones. And he saw a great many bones on the floor, bones that were very dry. He would feel that. It would be tangible for him. It would be almost physical for him. His consciousness would be overwhelmed. And I wonder what it would be like for a Jewish priest to be walking back and forth in a valley of dry bones. For some of us, when we think about that, we think, that's gross. Oh, that's creepy. And indeed it is. Indeed, no question. But I wonder... I wonder, this is just my imagination based on reading some other things. I wonder what a Jewish priest would have felt. I wonder if he walked through that valley and began to tell himself the backstory. Like, these bones are all unburied. Was there a battle here? Is this the scene of a great slaughter? Was there a terrible defeat? So that an army from another land was wiped out in this valley? And now, and, there was, and, and their enemies had no respect for them, and so they did not bury them. Or maybe he thought, maybe this is the scene of a genocide. Maybe it wasn't a fair fight at all. Or maybe, maybe he thought back to the stories of his ancestors, people like Abraham, Joseph, um, Jacob, people who said uh, that they wanted their bones to be buried in the land that God was giving them. You see, back in the days of his ancestors, people like Joseph and Jacob in particular were buried, or they died outside the land that God had promised them. And they, they told their descendants, you, when God gives you the land and when God leads you out of where we are and leads you to the land that he promised us, take my bones with you. And I wonder if Ezekiel walking in this valley of dry bones that are unburied, I wonder if he was overwhelmed at the sadness of all of these people whose bones should be back in the land of their ancestors. And here they are, unburied in a foreign land. I wonder if he was overwhelmed with sadness at the reality 
of death and alienation. But then he's also a Jewish priest. He understands the laws of the Lord, and he understands that dead things contaminate living things. That is to say that dead things make living people dirty. And I wonder if as he walked this valley, knowing that the Spirit of God had taken him here in this vision, I wonder if he was overwhelmed with the sense of defilement, of the dirtiness, the contamination of all of these bones rising up, and him not being able to do anything about it, but being defiled by all of this death around him as it rubbed up against his shins and as he had to touch it. I wonder if the defilement, the dirtiness, the contamination overwhelmed his soul. And then in that moment, when God says to him, Ezekiel, son of man, which son of man just means human, human, human being, (laughs) Ezekiel, these bones are my people Israel, the people of Israel, my people. I wonder what happened in his heart. These bones are the people of Israel, my people. He's in a land that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord has brought him to. He's in a land of death, defilement, and it's his own people. And when God tells him what that means, God says to him, my people are saying, they're saying our bones, our bones are dry and weary. We, are, we have no hope. We are cut off. God's people are lost in death. They are lost in defilement, dirtiness, and they are lost in despair. That is the state of God's people. And so the first thing that we want to see about what happens when the spirit of the sovereign Lord is leading us is that the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is able to give His people insight, experiential insight into what is happening for us. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord takes Ezekiel into this vision so that he, in his very being, experiences the death, defilement, and despair of his people. He is experiencing in his guts, in all of his consciousness, the death, defilement, and despair that his people are going through. And he's doing it because the spirit of the living God is inscribing and interpreting the life of his people to him. God wants him to see what his people are going through. God wants him to feel what his people are going through. God wants Ezekiel to know that God knows what his people are going through. God sees it. God knows it. And God has something to say about it. And that's why it's so important for us as a church to do the kinds of practices that the Community Development Research Group have asked us to do. Somebody might say, well, what's the good of a prophet having a vision? Honestly. The man just went to sleep, woke up, said he saw something, and golly, right? And you could write it off. doesn't matter. But it does matter. God wants to inscribe on our beings. He wants to write like a scribe on the very, the very paper of our souls. He wants to write something, write reality, write truth. He wants us to, to feel the experience of our community and to know that he sees it. And so we have to do things like reflect, like notice. Notice what's happening around us. We have to take time to say, okay, I'm noticing stuff and it disturbs me. And then we have to bring that to God and say, God, when I notice what's happening around me, it makes me lament. God, when I see things around me, it makes me long for something. It makes me long for a better reality. When, when, I, when I see what's happening around me, I long for joy. I long for beauty. I long for something good. God calls us there by the power of his Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord calls us to the Valley of Dry Bones and takes us there so that he can write the experience of our community on our souls, so that he can tell us what he has to say about that. And I want to point out that Ezekiel does not know what to do in this situation. 
And I wonder for us, when we think about like the dry bones in our lives, the dry bones in Northeast London, the dry bones in the church, we don't know what to do about it, right? When, when a community is actually overwhelmed with death, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what can we do? What can we do? It's terrible, right? When a community is overwhelmed by death, then people are, they're allowing hostility to grow among them. You know, people allow the beef from five years ago to still be the beef today. The argument that happened 10 years ago is still a reason to never talk. People allow the hostility and the resentment of generations past to continue to breed death today. And the crazy thing is that in the church that happens as much as anywhere else, right? When, when death reigns in a community, people have no answer and no comfort in the face of actual physical death. People are suffering and grieving and nobody has a word of presence and comfort. Nobody, nobody uh, has a word of, like, of life to bring. People can look around and see the suffering of the world and they're like, man, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to go. Because everybody is under the rule of death. It's terrible. And we don't think often about being ruled by defilement, but good gracious, this is real. Man, when, when God's people are under the, 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 the reign or the control of defilement, it's awful. Leaders begin to abuse and to manipulate the people that they are supposed to be serving. And they're given permission to do it. When, when defilement is at work in a community, people keep secrets they should not keep. And people who have been hurt feel like they know that they, they know that they've been made dirty and they don't think that anybody cares. And they certainly don't feel safe to tell the truth about it. When defilement is in control of a community, then things like identity purity become very important because people feel it and they're like, well, wait a minute. Don't go learn that course. Don't, don't, don't go get that kind of job. Don't talk that way because then you'll be too white. And you won't be true to your true identity. And so people will actually keep each other from growing, keep each other from exploring the beautiful good world that God has made for the sake of maintaining identity purity. Racial injustice happens and defiles, defiles whole communities. People tell lies and defilement grows. It's awful. It's awful. And when despair is ruling in the church, or in the community, oh, good gracious. It's terrible, right? When, when we cannot imagine a good future, then all we do is we look back at the past and we're like, man, I just want to remember the days when I could get up in the morning, have my bowl of cereal, watch television for five hours straight, and just watch the, the Roadrunner beat up on Wile E. Coyote over and over and over again. I just want to be safe. I just want to go back to what was, what was good. And then we create this mythical past that was not real. And we say, oh yeah, back then, when people knew what was true and people knew what was, what was false and people really spoke up for the truth and, and the church was strong and this and that, we create this false past and we just wish that we could go back. And we look at the future and we think, ah, there's no hope. There's no hope. And people, y'all you, you know this, like people today manufacture despair for the sake of power right, for the sake of preserving power. But in the church, the thing that's crazy to me is that it's so easy for us to, to actually be ruled by despair. And, and when that happens to us, we begin to lose our vocabulary. Did you know that? Our, our language stops changing, stops growing. This is a danger for a guy like me because I love learning. I want to learn about theology. But when we, when we go back to the past and we say, well, the past was good, and we've lost despair, or we've lost hope for the future, then what we will do is we'll just talk about God in old language. And we'll say, well, the old ideas about God are the only ones that matter. Now, the old ideas of God do matter. God has always been present in his people, and so we've we got to learn from the past. But when we have despair controlling us, our, our conversation about God does not come out of our lived experience of God being alive in us right now. It comes out of the sense that, oh, today... Today, there's nothing to celebrate. You just got to go to the past. 
and we lose the ability. We lose the ability to see a future where God is alive and present, where God might actually allow us to experience the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, as it says in the Psalms. We lose that ability. And so vision dies. People die. It's awful. We are those dry bones. We can become those dry bones. And when we look around us, those are things to lament. And these are not things to shy away from. Again, the spirit of the sovereign Lord takes Ezekiel to the valley of dry bones. That means he takes us as a church in Jesus Christ into the valley of dry bones because he wants to inscribe on our souls the experience of our community. And so, friends, it actually calls us as a church to look even more carefully, to notice even more deeply the community around us, the communities around us. Think about Northeast London. Think about the ways in which despair might manifest itself and grip people's lives in Northeast London. Think about the way in which it feels like the future is being stolen from children in Northeast London. Think about the ways in which defilement might manifest itself and destroy people's lives in Northeast London, whether that's through abuse, whether that's through just deception, people living double lives, who knows, right? Think about the ways in which death wants to reign in Northeast London. God does not call us to look away, and he certainly does not tell us to make it seem less serious than it actually is. God wants to inscribe on our souls the suffering, the reality of our people, because he loves his people. And this is the incredible thing to me about this passage. God takes Ezekiel to the Valley of Dry Bones, and God is there with Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. God is there. The Almighty God. The God who is holy and pure. The God who is righteous. The God who is all love and all life. The source of life itself. He is present in the Valley of Dry Bones. He is present in the despairing community. He is present in the community ruled by death. He is present in the community that is defiled by sin. He is present there. It is not true that where death is, God is not there. It is not true that where people are defiled or defiling one another, God is not there. It is not true that where people are controlled by despair, that God is absent. That is not true. Who did Jesus go and spend his time with when he was here? When he, the true son of man, the true human being, walked among us in our valley of the dry bones. Who did Jesus spend his time with? Did he not spend it with the tax collectors? Did he not spend it with the people who had to sell their bodies for sex in order to survive? Did he not spend his time with the people who were defiled? He did. Who did Jesus spend his time with? if not the people that were lost in despair. He was there with them, weeping with them, bringing hope to them. He spent time with the leper who was defiled by his disease, and the disease left him and he was made clean. Jesus was present there in the Valley of Dry Bones. And did not Jesus raise the dead? Did he not walk into the grave itself, speak into the grave itself and say, hey, Let out my friend Lazarus. And Lazarus came out of the grave. That is what Jesus did. He went to the valley of dry bones. And dry bones walked out, living people. But it didn't stop there. Jesus did not just stay outside the grave. He himself went into the grave. He went into the realm of death itself where disease and despair find their their, their, their fullest manifestation where the greatest enemy of all is the ruler. And nobody comes back from death unless you are the Lord of life. And he did. He went into the grave. The Lord of life went into death itself. He died our death. And death could not hold him. And he broke open the tombs. And he he led his people forth alive out of the graves. And let me tell you this, that when he did that, He far surpassed the wildest imagination of any person on the planet. Even the people that knew the prophecy of Ezekiel, which we've just read, where the sovereign Lord promises to open up the graves and lead his people out, 
Nobody expected a physical resurrection in history, in the middle of it all. Nobody was looking for that. Jesus, the true Son of Man, comes into our valley of dry bones, comes into our defilement, comes into our despair, comes into our death, and leads us out alive by the power of the Spirit. Glory be to God. And this is the amazing promise that that God wants to bring to us and bring through us to our community. When he brings us into the valley of dry bones, he doesn't just want to to make us experience the sufferings of our people. He doesn't want to just leave us there with with the suffering of our people inscribed on our hearts and minds so that we shudder at how overwhelmingly awful everything is. That is not where God leaves this leaves us. It's not where he ends the story. But what he did in Jesus Christ, he does in kind of a shadowy way with Ezekiel. He says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And this is the amazing thing. We don't know what to do with death, but Jesus does. We don't know what to do with despair, but Jesus does. We don't know what to do with defilement, but Jesus does. And, and, the, and God's answer to those things is life. God's answer to death is, I will give you life. God's answer to defilement, I will give you life by my spirit. God's answer to despair, I will give you life by my spirit. And so God leads Ezekiel to speak the word of the Lord to these dead bones, these dry bones. And the bones hear the word of the Lord. Friends, God can make dead things hear. He can command dead things and they respond and they reconnect with each other. But this is the crazy thing to me, is that when they reconnect, after all the clicking and clacking and scuttling and rolling and things are locked in place, and then the tendons come up, and the the muscles form, the organs are placed into the body, and and then the skin covers it all, Ezekiel says, still there was no breath. Friends, it's not enough. Let me let me put this another way. God never intended the word to be spoken without the spirit coming. God never intended the word to be spoken without the spirit coming. Ezekiel spoke the word of God to the dry bones and they heard it, but there was no breath. And so God's promise that he would make those bones come to life was not yet fulfilled. They're still dirty. They're still defiled. They're still dead. So God says to Ezekiel, prophesy, son of man, prophesy to the breath and say, come from the four winds, O breath, and enter these slain that they may live. And he says, I did it. And the breath came and entered them and they stood up, a vast army. (laughs) Hallelujah to God. That is the life that God intends to bring to all creation. Because the sovereign spirit is the Lord, the giver of life. God, the sovereign Lord, is not so weak that he cannot keep us alive. God is strong enough to keep us alive. He is strong enough to keep all things in existence. And so when these bones are on the valley floor, when these people are in exile, when these realities are here in our neighborhood, they are not Here, because God is too weak to prevent them. No, they are not too weak. And they are not, or sorry, God is not too weak. And these things are are not present because God is absent. None of those things are true. No. What is true is that the sovereign Lord is Lord over all things. And as we read in the psalm, he is Lord even over our breath. And the psalm tonight said that God removes the breath of living things and they return to the dust. But then God sends his spirit and they are created and God renews the face of the ground. Friends, our breath is not our own. Our spirit is not our own. We don't belong to ourselves. We are in the hands of the Almighty God, the Sovereign Lord. And when God removes our breath and we return to the dust, it's not the end. That's the beginning. Because then God sends his spirit on this dirty dust 
And then we are truly created anew. When does creation happen, friends? When does creation happen? It happens when the dead are raised to new life in the Son of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's where creation happens. Let's, re let's recollect for a moment. The Sovereign Lord, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, is Lord over life and death. And so, when God promises his people life, he is able to bring it about. Because their exile, he is able to be with them in that exile. He has been faithful to his promises. Their exile, like he, all of this is happening so that he might actually lead them to life. And friends, this is the truth about our neighborhood, about our own lives, that the great pain of death, the great pain of despair, the great pain of the defilement that we go through is actually God preparing us to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive the life of Jesus Christ, his son, as he pours out his spirit on us. And so, friends, when we look at our neighborhood, when we look at the church, let us not say, oh no, God, all of these things are overwhelming and we don't know what to do. But let us say, God, you are preparing to reveal your new creation here. Let's not say, God, you were, why are you not good enough or, more, or powerful enough to stop the evil from happening in the first place? He can take it. You can rage at him all you want, and you should. You've got to be honest with God. But let's also remember and say, you are the sovereign Lord of life. If there is death here, it is so that you can reveal your life where death is. And let us ask him again and again to pour out his spirit, that he would send the spirit from the four winds where the spirit was removed to, that the spirit would come and bring new life to those who are dead and despairing and defiled. That, that, friends, is life indeed. The life of the eternal God that cannot be overcome by death because Jesus passed through death and death is now overcome in him. This life of the Holy Spirit that unites us and binds us to Jesus Christ is actually now reality in us. It's reality. God has poured his spirit out on the church. The spirit of the living God dwells in his people. He is bringing life to the neighborhood. He is bringing life to Northeast London. He is bringing life. And friends, we are called to lament. We are called to bring our longings to God. But we are called to rejoice because in Jesus Christ, God has already fulfilled his promise. In Jesus Christ, life has come. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, life is still coming. And so my prayer for you and for us as a church is that we would say yes to God's invitation. When he says he wants to inscribe the experience of our community on us, that we would say yes to that. And that when God says to us, speak the word of the Lord, we would say yes to that. And when God says to us, call on me and I will pour out my spirit, that we will call on him and call on the Holy Spirit and see God move. And that God would write in our lives the story of Jesus, the history of the Son of God, alive in us by the power of the Holy Spirit here, Northeast London, 2021. So, Father in heaven, you are life itself. Holy Spirit, you are the Lord, the giver of life. Would you please rescue us, almighty God, from death, defilement, despair. You have done it in Jesus. But God, we recognize that we are tempted. So, Lord, send it away from us. Send away despair. Send away death. Send away defilement. Spirit of God, fill us with life forevermore, we pray. Life that is good, life that is clean, life that is abundant and hopeful. Prepare us now to come to the table, Lord Jesus, to feast with you here. We pray in your name.